Greetings and welcome to the Cell Guru Show. We've got very interesting phones coming in. Uh, we've got the LG Velvet. Now, it's called the Velvet and it is a very smooth experience, but it's a lot of things that they've put into this phone that is dramatically different. I'll show you the first one. LG really taking forward this dual snap and screen part, but does it have anything else besides that? Then we'll move on to the Vivo V20 SE. The Vivo V20 series is becoming very, very interesting. We're hearing that there's another phone that may be coming in a short while, but at this present moment, let's talk about the SE. Now, the Vivo V20 had auto eye focus this doesn't have that feature but almost everything else plus of course we'll do our qualcomm segment which is a great one this time something that affects all of us the battery in a phone that and a whole lot more happening on the cell guru show Let's start off with news coming in from the world of mobiles and Oppo had their Inno Day 2020 and this is something that they've been doing. I think they did it last year also where they come up with all the cool things that will be coming out in the future. So these are concepts and prototypes. They did three of them including a rollable phone. You can literally actually stretch it out to whatever screen size you want. Oppo held its annual innovation summit, the Oppo Inno Day, this week. The company showed off three major innovations, including a rollable smartphone called the Oppo X 2021 concept. Yes, you heard that right. Oppo showed off a phone that can stretch from 6.7 to 7.4 inches by rolling out its display. The rolling OLED panel allows the phone to be thinner and prevents creases unlike foldable phones. Next up, the company introduced its second generation AR glass that can be connected to the Oppo Find X2 Pro to view AR content and movies. Finally, tying it all together is the Oppo Side Reel AR app that enables AR enhanced indoor navigation inside malls and similar spaces. Clearly, the star of the show was the Oppo X2021 concept but it remains to be seen if we will see a production version sometime next year. In news that should come as a relief to iOS developers, Apple has announced that it will reduce its commission from 30% to 15% for any developer, making less than $1 million every year. The reduced commission applies to almost 98% of developers on the App Store. The move comes ahead of the European Competition Commission's investigation into anti-competitive practices by the Apple App Store. The change in commission, however, should not have much of an impact on Apple's profits as these developers generate only 5% of App Store profits. It should, however, encourage more indie developers to start developing apps for iPhones, iPads and MacBooks. And now our top story, this is the LG Velvet. Now, LG has had success with these snap-on phones. So they decided to take it forward. And a lot of expectation was how would they really implement it with a phone called Velvet? Is it the smooth experience? Is it going to be the kind of phone, the materials they use? Well, it's a combination of all things. From the outer side, the materials are very interesting. I have the cover on it right now, but the phone in itself also is very, very well made. Now, it's a big phone. And you made much, much bigger when you actually open it out and you have the snap-on screen. Some of the quick observations I have, my first impressions is, uh, LG obviously doing very well with these snap-on screen phones, much cheaper than foldable or rollable phones. So that's point number one. Point number two, I love the screen on the outer side of the cover. I wish more companies would take to it because this is a really smart thing to do. I don't have to have anything to do with the phone and you know I can get all my information my notifications and a lot of other things on the outer screen so this is like a three screen phone one here two inside then we'll talk about the camera and everything else but one of the things that surprised us it's actually a pretty interesting thing to do many other companies haven't explored it this comes with the snapdragon 845 so people would say two generations behind but it is still an eight series processor it's not a six or a seven series and then the price is still pretty aggressive let's take a look at our review of the lg velvet a screen so nice lg did it twice the LG Velvet brings a foldable phone under 50,000 rupees with two really good looking 6.8 inches screen. Sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? Well, that's what LG is bringing to the table.
The LG Velvet is technically a foldable device but instead of the screen folding it has a secondary display accessory that you can use as per your convenience. Aesthetically, LG has done a lot of work here. The phone is tall, sleek and feels good to hold in the hand. It also has a curved display which means content looks really good on the screen. The battery is 4300 mAh which means the Velvet will last you throughout the day. LG does have support for faster charging but it's not the shiniest feature of this phone. That award goes to the snappable secondary screen that LG calls dual screen. It is essentially the same display as the main velvet screen. There is an outer display on the screen which can be used to get a quick peek at the time and any notifications the phone may have received. The main purpose of the screen however is to make multitasking easier. By default, the phone has some app combinations for multitasking but you can create your own combinations and place them on the home screen. All of this multitasking means the phone needs some powerful internals. That is where the velvet falls a bit short. LG has only used the Snapdragon 845 which is a flagship chipset from 2 years ago. While this doesn't make the phone any slower, it does mean that the Velvet will not be as snappy as some of the other 2020 phones. The phone still runs most apps with ease and gaming is smooth. Moving to the optics, the phone has a triple camera array that looks like water droplets. There is a 48 megapixel main sensor, an 8 megapixel ultra wide sensor and a 5 megapixel depth sensor. The camera manages to capture details in well-lit conditions but the overall performance is a bit disappointing here. But the 16 megapixel selfie camera did well and the pictures were satisfactory. On the software side, the Velvet runs on the Android 10 and is skinned with LG UX 10 on top. There is 6GB RAM and 128GB internal storage on board this phone with support for additional storage. LG has once again tried to change the formula for a successful smartphone. While it did tick the box with the dual screen accessory, its inferior processor and the lack of a higher refresh rate screen mean that this phone fails to compete with 2020 flagships. Moreover, at present, you can only get the velvet with the dual screen cover, which means you will be shelling out Rs 49,990 for the foldable experience. For the experiences you deserve, that is our special segment where we take a deep look into our phones, things that we take for granted but never think really about, we bring that to the forefront and this time we're talking about battery and charging, a critical thing for everybody. If I was to ask you a simple question, you know, the answer to that question would take about two hours to complete. What's the question? What all do you use your smartphone for? You know, we're living in this digital age where everything from our car keys to our fan switch to the lighting control in our house has all been replaced by our smartphone. Our smartphones have become a centerpiece, our control system for all our devices our entire life. Whatever we want to do, we do it on a smartphone. But for us to do the hundreds of things every day that we do on our phones, the phone needs to last through the entire day. A dead phone means zero activity, thus phones require bigger batteries. These days we see phones coming with 5000, 6000 mAh batteries and here's a crazy one. Samsung recently launched the Galaxy M51 phone with a massive 7000 mAh battery, making it the first phone in the country with a battery this big. But obviously battery life is an important aspect in a smartphone's report card. The absolute bare minimum a phone must last, like I said, is through the entire day. But having a bigger battery doesn't solve the entire problem. We're always on the move and we want our smartphones to be available with us 24-7. Charging technology needs to keep pace with battery capacity. Imagine waiting for 6 to 8 hours for your phone to charge to 100% like it used to at one time. We want our devices to charge faster so that those big batteries fill up quickly and we can get moving. Now, this has resulted in the emergence of fast charging techniques and smartphone manufacturers are now integrating these standards into their devices. In just the past few years, we've seen charging speeds go from 15 watts 
to 50 watts and sometimes even in excess of 100 watts with companies promising 50% battery charge in 5 to 10 minutes of plugging in. But just a fast charge again tells you only half the story. There's a lot of tech involved that many of us are not well versed with. Charging phones faster than usual requires additional attention to be paid to how warm they are getting as faster charging increases device temperature. If you get it wrong, the battery can overheat and ultimately damage the components inside. There's a lot of other smart tech involved from the time you plug in a phone to the time you actually take it out. When to charge at higher speeds, when to slow it down, when to trickle charge, when to stop. Charging our phones is something we take for granted and don't really give it a second thought. But there is a lot of effort that goes into creating these fast, efficient and mostly safe techniques. While there are various proprietary fast charging techniques, most manufacturers have adapted to a standard and made it universal. Qualcomm's Quick Charge. With its latest iteration, the Quick Charge 5 standard, Qualcomm now promises up to 50% battery charging in 5 minutes or less. Of course, this requires some great research and development to get it right. So let's hear from them and understand what it takes to create such superior charging techniques. Let's first talk to George Paparisos, uh, Senior Director, Product Management, Qualcomm Technologies. Uh, George, great to have you on the show. Thank you so much for joining us. My first question, of course, is why did Qualcomm develop and introduce Quick Charge? Hi, Rajiv. Thanks for having me on the show. As you were saying, portable devices and phones uh, started uh, featuring a lot more capabilities and therefore they needed larger batteries. Uh, due to the lack of any industry standard, OEM started developing their own proprietary methods. And of course those methods resulted in higher cost, R&D cost and also interoperability. And this is when Qualcomm stepped in with the introduction of uh, Quick Charge 2.0, which was a very low cost and very high power way to charge your phone faster by using the standard USB cables and connectors, which was great for the industry. Of course, the requirements evolved and so did Quick Charge and now we are with Quick Charge 5. And we keep improving in terms of charging speed, efficiency, safety, and also the communication protocol. Well, that's very interesting. Now, what are the challenges associated with developing faster charging speeds? There's two main challenges, really. Uh, one of them is how to achieve uh, better efficiencies all the time. And the second one is how to address any interoperability issues. Now, some of your viewers may already know that we recently introduced Quick Charge 5 into the market. Quick Charge 5 has the capability to feature efficiency of 98% or even higher. And in terms of addressing the interoperability challenges, we recently introduced a technology called Smart Identification of Adapter Capabilities. And what this technology does is instead of just relying on the adapter, the power source, to tell you its capabilities, we actually can detect their real capabilities and adjust charging performance accordingly. And of course, safety is always a big factor here. The latest technology we introduced has 18 or more different levels of safety. And this is very critical since we're talking about very high power levels these days. What other measures is Qualcomm taking to support consumers in their fast charging experience? Uh, for Qualcomm, obviously, consumer experience is number one priority. So one of the things we did from the beginning is we developed a compliance program, a very strict one, to make sure that there is interoperability among all the accessories and all the portable devices. Another thing we're doing is we keep working with uh, partners like uh, retail partners and brands so that we can have more accessories both in terms of type and in terms of numbers on the market. So there's more ways for the consumer to actually enjoy fast charging. And last but not least, as probably some of your viewers know, Qualcomm Quick Charge has a very simple logo or mark. So this is very easy for the consumer to identify and to make the right purchase in terms of buying an accessory. Wow, very fascinating. This whole subject is so great. Are there any other safety issues when you're charging this fast? Uh, Qualcomm has worked with many OEMs over the years to actually extend battery life and also adjust charging power based on environmental and other conditions. Uh, one example is the battery saver technology which was introduced a few years ago. 
Uh, another important thing to know is that Quick Charge has built-in intelligence that allows communication between the accessory and the phone. And this allows a power source to only give a specific voltage or current to a device that can obviously accept those levels. And this is obviously everything is under the hood. What has changed from the previous generation of Quick Charge 4 Plus to the new Quick Charge 5 standard? Uh, Quick Charge 4 Plus and Quick Charge 5 are indeed backwards compatible. Quick Charge 5 is adding a 20 volt operation and, and as uh, some people know uh, the higher the voltage you support the lower the current you need for a specific power level and this is what makes quick charge 5 capable of reaching uh, 100 watts or more of charge power and when consumers use those implementation they can actually achieve uh, very fast charging like uh, 0 to 50 percent in five minutes <music>
the Vivo V20 SE can in many ways be considered a cut-down version of the excellent Vivo V20. The phone takes plenty of visual cues from the V20 in the form of a notch display and similar styling. The phone is light and comfortable to hold. The plastic back attracts too many smudges which pulls down the premium feel of the phone. The V20 SE comes with a 6.44 inch AMO LED display with an in-display fingerprint scanner just like the Vivo V20. The display is bright and has good viewing angles. This phone has a triple camera setup at the back consisting of a 48 megapixel primary camera and 8 megapixel ultra wide angle camera that's also capable of macro photography and a 2 megapixel bokeh camera. The shots came out well in daylight and we were impressed with its bokeh photos. However, the low light performance was average. This is where Vivo compromised a bit to reduce the price tag. We got the Snapdragon S20G in the V20. In this special edition phone, we have the Snapdragon 665 with 8GB of RAM and 128GB of storage powering it. While the phone didn't give us a chance to complain, heavy games did lag a bit. The V20 SE runs on Android 10 with FunTouch OS on top. The UI is simple and neat. However, there is some bloatware that this phone comes with, which we are not a fan of. The phone is loaded with 4100mAh of battery and the phone easily lasted us a day. There is 33 watt fast charging with the charger in the box which we think is a huge plus. The V20 SE is priced at 20,990 rupees. The Selguru verdict? The Vivo V20 SE brings a lot to the table but didn't do a very good job at convincing us that it is the best overall package for the price. The phone is not for gamers or anyone seeking performance, but if you're in the market for a good-looking phone that has decent optics, it could be one to consider. That then was the Cell Guru Show for this week, but we've got a great lineup next week. Do join me.